Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Everyone, uh, welcome to another session of uh, of the Anglo Bolivian Society's webinar. Uh, thank you for being here. I remind everybody uh, the modality of moderation that we're using here. Uh, Matthias Strecker, the, the presenter of the current webinar, uh, is going to be presenting, and all of you can send your questions using the Q and A button. At, uh, you can send your questions all across. Uh, I'm going to collect and read at the end of the presentation. Or if you want to to have a direct question, you just need to raise your hand, and I, uh, at the end of the presentation, I will give the mic to those who raise their hands when if they prefer to do uh, straightforward the, the questions to Matthias. With that, I'm going to introduce now to Winston Moore, our chairman, uh, to beginning with this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Well, good evening, uh, good afternoon, and good morning to uh, an attendee from California. Uh, today, we're, uh, we're honored to have uh, Matthias Strecker, uh, who is in the Chiquitania, and he's giving him an, an, uh, the following presentation on explaining and presenting rock art to the public, the case of Robore in the Chiquitania Santa Cruz. Um, I just like to mention, you will see the banner behind me. Um, we celebrated our 30th anniversary in October at the Houses of Parliament. And this is effectively our 31st year and our first presentation. So uh, we look forward to welcoming you to attend other presentations throughout the year. And I'd like to hand over to Kate Ford, our co-chair, to give the introduction. Thank you very much. Thanks, Winston. Well, again, good evening if you're in the UK and good uh, buenas tardes if you're in Bolivia and good morning if you are indeed in California. Matthias Strecker has been investigating the petroglyphs and rock paintings of Bolivia since 1983. In 1985, only 95 sites in Bolivia were registered. In 1987, with a small group of Bolivian friends, he founded the Sociedad de Investigaciones del Arte Rupestre de Bolivia, and its acronym is rather difficult to say in English, it sounds a bit odd, CIOB, but that's what I shall refer to it as from now on. Um, the first edition of what was to become its annual Boletin was published the same year, 1987. Meanwhile, some 1,000 sites have been registered, so between then and now. Matthias's work has always involved comparative studies with the rock markings of other Latin American regions. Studies of petroglyphs and rock paintings in most of the South American countries had already been published by the time he founded CIAB. Matthias's Arte Rupestre de Bolivia of 1987 was the first monograph in a series of contributions published by the society. 35 years on now, the publications have gone from that first overview to specific studies of the imagery of different locations all over Bolivia. CIAB researchers now include professional archeologists, anthropologists, and conservators. Small groups of investigators and local guides undertake research and cataloging expeditions in most parts of the country, no longer on horseback, but still dependent on the season, the weather. Since its invention in 2005, use of the D-stretch digital imaging tool that brings out few differences in photographs has made it possible to enhance almost invisible drawn marks that are too faint to be traced, the traditional way of recording rock art. Nevertheless, recording by drawing remains essential. The bulletin has gone from a slim typed booklet stapled together to a glossy full color illustrated journal that's also available online via the CR webpage. We are very, pleased to have dragged Matthias away from a mass of projects, all with deadlines, to talk to us about CIAB's work, especially its latest publication, which has been funded with German and Swiss support. Arte Rupestre de Robore Guia para Visitantes is a collaboration between CIAB and the municipality of Robore with its 80 eight zero sites of rock paintings or petroglyphs. 
The book is in Spanish and English, lavishly illustrated, and sets out not only the richness of the imagery in this region, but also the difficulties of conservation and management. So thank you very much for attending. And thank you, Matthias, and I hand over to you now. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being with you. So let's start right away. Okay. Um, in this talk, I will present preliminary results of our research project on rock art in the municipality of Robori, which forms part of Chiquitania in the department of Santa Cruz in East Bolivia. Rock art in this region has been known since the 1950s. Numerous reports have been written on the subject. However, systematic research and recording has only been achieved in the last few years. The current project of the Bolivian Rock Art Research Society, CIAP, began in 2020 and received partial funding by the German Gerda Henkel Foundation and the Swiss Embassy in Bolivia. Well, um, Chiquitania forms part of the Bolivian lowlands. It is located between the humid Amazon region in the north and the dry Chaco in the south. Next. Robori landscapes with their rich fauna and flora are very attractive for excursions, particularly the Chiquitano dry forest, which is a unique eco region in Bolivia and the world. Next. Our project began as a rescue initiative. In 2019, for several months, there were devastating wildfires in Chiquitania that affected some rock art sites. Fires again occurred in the following years. Prior to our project, no comprehensive survey of rock art and archaeological sites had been undertaken. No systematic analysis of rock paintings and engravings. Although tourism to some of the sites had been going on for years, and vandalism has occurred. Next. We formed a research team dealing with locating sites, photographic recording drawings, an archaeological survey, studying ethnohistoric sources, a management plan, conservation analysis, cleaning of graffiti in a cave, and a educational campaign, seminars, workshop, and the publication of a guidebook. Next. In order to understand the cultural background of rock art, we have to study archaeology, ethnohistory, and ethnology. Unfortunately, these data are still scarce. Though archaeological finds have been made in a number of places, we still know very little about regional prehistory. Next. We assume that people have lived in Chiquitania for at least 4,000 years. An archeologist from Santa Cruz excavated test pits at three sites in Robore municipality and came up with an early dating of 6,500 BC. However, he only presented his work in a public lecture, not in a scientific journal. We are not sure about the context and what he actually dated. On the other hand, in San Jose de Chiquitos, north of our study region, professional archaeologists uh, have carried out excavations and research, and there are reliable data from 1500 BC till the colonial period. Next. Chiquitania is well known for its Jesuit missions that have been declared World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. The first Spaniards crossed the region in 1550 in the expeditions that tried to find the land of gold or El Dorado. 
Nearly 150 years later, the Jesuits founded their missions in several places. There were numerous indigenous groups, each with its own language. At least 10 of them were settled in the missions. Chiquitano was established as a common language. The Jesuit priests wrote numerous reports, and some of them described traditional indigenous life and customs. For example, Francisco Borges, Juan Patricio Fernandez, and Julian Knogler. According to these sources, indigenous people in Chiquitania lived from hunting and small scale agriculture. Unfortunately, none of the missionaries mentioned rock art, which apparently was unknown to them, although some rock paintings were still produced during colonial times. Next, please. One of the Jesuit churches at Santiago de Chiquitos, the center of our research. Next. So far, we have found 79 rock art sites, most of them in mountain ranges at a height of 250 to 800 meters. We have received information on other sites that we have not yet located. So the number of sites definitely is much larger. At least 100 sites, maybe more. Next. There are different types of rock art sites. Here are examples of small caves. Next. Numerous paintings are found in rock shelters. Next. The rock shelter at Motaku, which has a large panel with paintings belonging to different periods. Next. Some paintings occur on the ceiling of arches or tunnels, in Spanish called arco. Next. Most of the rock art exists on vertical walls. Next. Pesoe is an exceptional site with deeply incised carvings on the rock wall. Next. And some engravings occur on bedrock. This site, Las Estrellas, is now used as a Christian sanctuary. Next. Some circular formation on the ground might be mistaken as petroglyphs, that is engravings, but actually are natural formations. Next. Water sources exist near or even at rock art sites, which is highly significant and may explain in part why these particular locations were chosen. Next. In order to analyze rock paintings, we have defined different categories of motives. Let's start with abstract or geometric elements. At many sites, there are dots forming compounds and zigzag lines. Next. One of the most common designs are grid patterns or nets. We use a computer program, D-Stretch, to enhance certain color channels, which enables us to recognize the paintings much better. Next. Occasionally, there are complex designs, including wavy lines, diamond shapes, and others. And you can see the difference between the photo on the left, the normal photo, and on the right, uh, on the upper right, 
there is the image in D stretch, which makes a huge difference. Next. Abstract elements at San Luis site, zigzag lines, parallel short strokes, dots, and others. Next. A circular design reminding of a wheel at Yororopa site in Robore and a very similar painting at a site to the east of Chiquitania. We find the so-called geometric tradition all over the department of Santa Cruz. Next. Maria Chica is an impressive site in the region of Concepcion outside our study area. It features numerous abstract elements that occur in identical or similar form at sites in Robore. Next. Some of these designs still occurred among indigenous groups in the lowlands at the beginning of the 20th century and were recorded by the Swedish ethnologist Erland Nordenskjöld. So we have body decoration, painting or tattoo, and we have the decoration of some objects in a similar way. Next. Another category of rock paintings depicts human figures. I have defined 15 different types and believe they were produced by several indigenous groups, probably in different periods, thus indicating a long sequence. A special type consists of humans with a head in form of a half moon. The legs and arms appear at thin lines. The feet may have three or four toes. These figures are shown in movement, sometimes in dynamic scenes where several persons interact. They are very similar to paintings of the Serie do style in Northeast Brazil. We do not know whether indigenous people in these two regions were related and how this style reached Chiquitania. Next. Some scenes depict everyday life. Here, a man is holding up a long stick directed at a round object in a plant. Maybe he wants to collect wild honey. Next. Another type of human figures is characterized by small round heads. In the second row on the left, a man carries a hunted animal on his back. Below, there are family scenes. A woman carries a child, a man, a child that holds on to his head. Two men are fighting with raised axes. Next, please. Other types of anthropomorphic figures are much more stylized. Below, on the left, rows of human figures that are holding hands. The Jesuit missionaries reported that Indians liked dancing, forming circles. Next, please. A few stick figures occur. On the right, the only case of an archer we have found. Below two long humans face each other. They they seem to wear some sort of clothing. Next. And these figures belong to the colonial period. At the top, the two men holding spears wear hats in European fashion. Below, on the left, two crude figures that closely resemble wall paintings in the church and monastery of San Jose de Chiquitos. Note that their faces include a nose in form of a V or 
angle. Next, please. Some human figures show headdress, possibly made of feathers, or a particular, a particular hairstyle. Next. In Robore municipality, we have found the only examples of war scenes in pre-Hispanic Bolivian rock art. At the top, two men are fighting with spears. On the left, a man stretches out his arms while his spear has hit his chest. Below, two men are holding up their axes. Next. The Jesuits commented on the frequent wars between neighboring indigenous groups that fought with bows and arrows or with clubs. Depictions of spears and spear throws in Chiquitania seem to belong to a pre-Hispanic period long before the arrival of the missionaries. But they were still used among tribes in the Amazon region in the late 18th century as recorded by the Jesuit Francisco Javier Ida. Next. Here are two figures out of a group of five or six human figures in a line marching in the same direction. And the one on the left is the largest. Uh, we believe that uh, these figures represent warriors on the war pass. The figure on the left is particularly carefully painted. The body is decorated externally with a line of dots a double line on the left, a single line on the right side, and there are dots above the head. His feet end in four short curved lines that remind of feline claws. Human figures decorated with dots in rock paintings of Cordoba, Argentina, have been interpreted by Sebastian Pastor and colleagues as persons wearing a garment made of jaguar or feline skin. They compare them to historic representations of Chiriguano warriors. So we tentatively interpret the procession of men as warriors and one of them dressed with a feline skin and the claw-like feet also refer to a jagger or feline. Now, of course, the jagger was the symbol of power, of war power. Next. A hunting scene. A hunter stabs a deer in its back. Next. Another kind of representation of humans are the handprints. Some were produced by using a special uh, technique. By deleting part of the pigment, the artist was able to decorate the palm of the hand with parallel lines. Similar hand images exist in other regions, such as the valleys, valleys of Western Santa Cruz department, but also in uh, Amazonia in the Amazon region in Brazil. Next. Let's have a look at the next category of rock paintings, animal figures. Male and female deer are represented and in one cave, even their tracks. A particular animal figure seems to represent a tapir. Next. 
According to a bi biologist who saw this row of animals, they are likely to represent wild pigs. In the center, a capybara, a rodent, which looks a bit like a guinea pig, but is much larger, about the size of a medium dog. We have not yet been able to identify the animal represented in the painting below. Next. Felines can be seen at a number of sites. At least one has spots and possibly represents a jaguar. Groups of monkeys occur at several sites. The line below the animals apparently indicates the branch of a tree. Next. A hunter behind a herd of monkeys. Mothers carry their babies on their back. And we believe it's uh, the monkey that you can see in the photos uh, on the right. One of several species existing in the region. Next. Bird figures include the South American ostrich called Nyandu and the Tucan. Next. And also the Tapacari. And we found some bird tracks. Other animals depicted are reptiles or lizards and turtles. Next. There are also snakes, frogs, or toads, a sort of beetle, though only two or four feet are indicated, and one representation of a spider. Why were these animals represented in rock art? And why are others missing? For example, we have not yet found any painting of fish, although they played some part in the diet of indigenous people. The British archaeologist and rock art expert Paul Barn once wrote an essay about animals in Paleolithic rock art and asked, where is the beef? He found out that the animals depicted do not correspond to the same amount to their importance as food for the hunters and their families. He concludes that some species dominate the art and that other types are rare or totally absent. Since Paleolithic people were certainly familiar with all aspects of their environment, it follows that rock art is not a random accumulation of artistic observations of nature. It has meaning and structure. The same holds true concerning rock paintings in Chiquitania. These images are closely related to ancient belief systems, which to a large extent are unknown to us. As I mentioned, we have cl uh, a clue why feline felines were represented and they were considered to be powerful animals and symbols of the power of warriors against their animals. Next, please. At site Cerro Banquete, two groups of paintings show felines in a significant context. One scene shows an animal that seems to grab a human figure. It could be interpreted as representing a hunter who died, but I believe it might be a symbolic reference to warfare between two warriors, one of whom has turned into a ferocious animal. The other scene shows a group of 14 human figures, some of whom raise axes. At the bottom, a feline is running towards several humans. Again, I'm inclined to interpret the feline as a reference to warfare. Next. We also have a variety of images of plants and possibly representing 
very specific plants would still have to be identified. Next. How old is the rock art? In the next phase of our project, we wish to excavate a site with rock paintings and date organic material such as charcoal from fireplaces. That should give us an idea when the site was used and when the images might have been painted. On the other hand, we try to establish a sequence of paintings by observing superimpositions. As the elements painted on top of others are younger and those underlying are older. And we can clearly observe in these photos here. At one side, we suppose a sequence of six periods, probably spanning hundreds of years. Next. You can observe that the dark red human figure is painted on top of a grid or net. And the drawing shows that among the latest elements are white animal figures, such as monkeys and birds. Next. At a number of sites, human or animal figures are younger than certain abstract designs, in this case, a group of dots. With regard to the different types of human figures, we found that the human representations with heads in form of a half moon occupied different sites than those with round heads. So far, there's just one site where they occurred together. However, they occupy different sections. So that is a strong indication that they were produced by different people in different times. Next. In Chiquitania, many paintings are affected by weathering processes, salts that contribute to breaking the rock surface and it's flaking off, plant growth, nests of termites and other factors. Some paintings have been lost completely. Others are preserved only in part. My colleague Freddy Taborda has undertaken a very detailed conservation study of some sites and uh, also um, made observations on possible uh, administration and protection of sites. Next. As so far no management exists and no control of visitors, some sites have been severely affected by vandalism. The last photo was taken in Cave Miserato, which in the 1970s still had a few ancient paintings. They have completely disappeared under the numerous inscriptions by visitors. Next. Cerro Banquete was one of the first rock art sites to be recorded and its status as heritage site was recognized by the National Institute of Archaeology. A small fence was erected in front of some paintings, but has disappeared. A signboard still stands in its place. But we never have had a proper administration or protection of this site or any other site so far. Next. On the other hand, visitation is being promoted as part of tourism. Signboards indicate the location of some of the sites and have also been set up along the proposed routes. However, there is no maintenance. Below on the left, a photo taken in 2008 
The photo on the right, 14 years later, and the inscription has disappeared. Next. Some posters and signboards promoting tourist visits to some sites contain very little information about the rock art. And sometimes theories such as the supposed antiquity of 10,000 years and an imaginary sequence which have no scientific basis. Next. Rock paintings are presented on posters, t-shirts, and public buildings. The Munis municipal council has proudly announced that Roboré is a capital of rock art in the department of Santa Cruz. Next. We need educational campaigns to raise community awareness about the fragility of rock art sites due to wildfires, natural environment, and in particular, vandalism by visitors. Archaeologist Marie Luz Choke taught students at several local schools about rock art. They copied images and painted them on stone slabs using natural pigments. Next. Two years ago in May 20, uh, no, this year, sorry, in May 2022, uh, last year, sorry, <laughs> last year in May 2022, we held seminars in Roboré and in Santiago de Chiquitos, informed about the preliminary results of our project and gave an introduction to local archaeology, rock art and conservation measures. But this is just the beginning of an, an education campaign, training campaign that has to go on for several years. Next. And here's the guidebook with Spanish and English texts that we published and that will be presented uh, in Robori and elsewhere. Actually, we intended to present it in September last year. And what happened? There were wildfires in all the region, and we couldn't do it. And uh, then we planned to be there in November. And we couldn't because there were a social unrest and street blockades. And uh, it, it wasn't possible. So now we plan to be there in March and present the book. And uh, I think uh, the local people would be very pleased to have this as a basis for interpreting rock art sites. Well, we recommend that visitors are always accompanied by local guides who are trained to explain not only the paintings or engravings, but also uh, animals and local plants. By paying a fee to the guides, visitors contribute to the local economy and to the, to the preservation of sites. The guides can inspect the sites and pay attention to proper visitor behavior. However, training courses for guides about archeology span and rock art have not yet taken place. We have scheduled them for this year, provided we receive funding for a new phase of our project. Next. We are very grateful to Gerda Henkel Foundation, the Swiss Embassy in Bolivia and Solidar Suisse that provided funding for the first phase of our project. The municipal government of Robery assists our work. Local guides play an important role in our fieldwork. Dr. Damien Rumi's biologist kindly commented on animal figures in Robori rock paintings. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Matias. Really interesting presentation. Uh, I will give now the, the space to Kate to do a final comments around that. And then we will open to any questions that you would like <clears throat> to do. Uh, as I remind, you can use the Q&A or raise your hands and we are going to give you the mic. Well, I want to say thank you very much, Matthias. It's fascinating to see the, the sort of, the way that the images are being, well, have been taken on board by the municipality because obviously it is a great tourist tool, but then it comes with commensurate dangers, doesn't it? That people are going to add their own little painting of a man on the top, which, you know, I see the temptation. <laughs> But it's very difficult to, to imagine. It's just a question of education, isn't it? Of, of making it seem, of making drawing on top seem shocking and, and stupid. So I, I suppose it's possible. But there, there was just one thing that occurred to me, the toad. I mean, I, I imagine the, the the drawings of toads have something to do with the hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic properties of toad venom. And, the, and it would have been some part of ritual, I guess. Yes, and fertility in water, of course. Yeah, yes. But, um, well, does, does anybody have any questions? Or are people still reeling slightly from the amazing <laughs> images? There, there are a couple of comments, more, more than questions, but I'm going to read one of Andrew Wilkins, who says, just say thanks. Can the book be purchased? Uh, well, the, we have the book in Bolivia. We are trying to get a few copies to the States, a few to Europe as well. And if anyone wants to have it, um, he or she can write us. Um, the contact address is in our website of the um, Sociedad de Investigación del Arte Rupestre de Bolivia. So it's quite easy to contact us. Good. I have Carolina Jusic who is asking to make a question to, to you, Matias. I'm going to give her the mic. So Carolina, you can talk now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the interesting talk and very inspiring. I would like to ask about these um, 15 types of anthropomorphic signs, motifs that you mentioned. Uh, so I would like to ask, how did you distinguish these 15 types? I mean, what kind of features or criteria did you take into consideration while working on this typology or uh, categories, whatever we call it? I mean, if yeah. there were some particular features of these signs or maybe um, the form of them or maybe the, yeah. uh, the, yeah. the stylistics or the techniques, how they were made yeah. or maybe something different. Yeah. Thank you. And this has been a very slow process taking several years. Um, so there are stylistic distinctions. In the case of um, the Siri Do style, this of course is of immense assistance that the Brazilian colleagues have defined a particular style and we find practically the same in Bolivia, in Chiquitania. So that is a formal, category, a um, definition that we can use. Uh, then different uh, stylistic criteria, but actually it is a working paper. I'm quite convinced that it's a good basis for continuing the work. Of course, we find compounds, groups, of paintings uh, that share the same stylistic uh, criteria, then in certain contexts, in certain sections of the wall and so on. As I've mentioned, the so-called roundheads and the so-called 
uh, men with half moon as a, a head occur in different parts, different sites, or at one side uh, in different sections. So this indicates they were made by different people. What we're lacking so far is superimpositions of uh, human on top of humans. We just have one or two cases, not enough to establish sequence. So we have a typology, but we do not have the age, the antiquity of these figures. Thanks, Matthias. I, I have now Susanna Rantz, who is raising her hand. Uh, Susanna, you have the mic, so you can talk now. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you, yeah. yes. Good. Thank you so much, Matthias. That was really inspiring, fascinating presentation. You did you mentioned the municipality of Robore as being supportive to your work. I wonder if there are any government organizations, any ministries, or any links with UNESCO World Heritage work that could help to um, make this um, a matter of national importance and get due support for your work. Um, within Bolivia, very difficult. Um, CIAP is a private scientific society. Uh, no government uh, financial support and uh, projects can only be carried out with assistance of foreign institutions. Um, so, no, the answer is no. <laughs> Just a tiny follow up question, if I may. Mm. Um, have you actually spoken, written, communicated with any ministries? And have you had any reply from them? Well, in the first case, to undertake archaeological work, you need a permit. You, uh, you must, uh, this work must be authorized by the Ministry of, of uh, Culture. We have contacted the Ministry of Culture many times. Um, in uh, the first case, it was in 2019 when the fires broke out. And um, we uh, sent a letter to the municipality and also to the ministry. We were very um, worried because on the one hand, we, we knew that a fire had reached rock art sites. On the other hand, we had heard that local people said, oh, no problem, we will start conservation work and we will restore the paintings. And we immediately responded and told them, you cannot do that because conservation work is not legal or is only legal when undertaken by professional conservators. And anyone else who touches rock art uh, and tries to clean it up uh, will destroy it. And we sent the same to the ministry. Um, and the ministry sent a mission there. And then they came back and said, oh, everything is fine. The rock art still exists and no damage has uh, occurred. Obviously, this is not the case. Uh, unfortunately, um, culture uh, and cultural affairs in Bolivia has very little resources and the Ministry of Culture also is very limited regarding its actions. Um, legally, the protection of archaeological sites, rock art sites, other cultural heritage sites is up to the state, but at the same time to communities, to the municipality, to the um, government of the department, gobernación, so they all can have a share. The problem is that they normally don't know what to do because they lack experts in 
archaeology, in uh, rock art, in heritage protection, and so on. Thanks, Matthias. I have Michael Elmer, who wrote the following questions for you. It says, can you please can you please say something about the pigments and likely, likely methods of application? Does the red come from iron compounds and where fingers, sticks, or feathers used to apply the color to the rocks? Um, well, personally, I'm not an expert on that. My colleague, Freddy Tabada, would be able to answer that much better than I can. Uh, there were, um, well, most of the paintings are in red color, different shades. And uh, we presume that all the reds come from minerals. Um, Freddy has started analysis of the pigments, just one FRX analysis, and yes, it was iron uh, oxide used. Um, there are also some black pigments, and we do hope that charcoal is in, involved, but because that might give us the possibility of direct dating, because you can date organic material. How was it applied? In part by using brushes with fibers and in some cases with the dots, possibly with fingertips. Thanks. I have uh, Reload Nemo Roselli who says, I saw in Franciscan Museum in Tarijas circle features made by Guarani people. Can you tell me the difference with Chico Chiquitano's circle? No, <laughs> I can't, <laughs> and no one can, because uh, we are still lacking the cultural background. We still don't know how, uh, who did what. But on the other hand, the so-called geometric tradition is uh, widespread and can be found in very large regions. So different people apparently shared similar um, designs in their artwork. Yeah, thank you. I would like to, from my part, make a question in, 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 to, to you, Matthias, is going a little bit of the efforts to preserve the work that has been uh, well, the archaeological sites. You have mentioned seminars uh, and the involvement of local communities, as well as the local guidance. Can you go a little bit deeper on that? On that uh, and say, because you say this is just the beginning and it's going to take many years. What are the main challenges going around uh, this effort? Well, there are, yes, there are really many challenges. Um, and uh, you have to work directly with the local people. And um, for example, there is an association of local guides and they should be trained. And ideally they would become a sort of site steward then that monitor site that um, help to protect them and so on. Um, you have also to take into account that the uh, level of public education is quite low. Um, and um, bes beside the local guides, there are other groups that need information um, tourist managers and so on, school children and so on. So uh, I hope that, for example, the book will be used by students, that people read it and tell others about it and take part in the general campaign to protect this heritage. 
Thank you very much, Matias. Uh, I have two hands raised. I will give please uh, first gave the, the space to Marcela, who wants to make a question. Marcela Montes. Marcela, go ahead, please. Marcela? Yeah. yeah, okay. Can you hear us? Yes, go, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, well, actually, it's it's John Montes who has a question. Um, thank you very much for a We're really together. fascinating uh, talk. Um, I, I, you, 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 you mentioned that there were, you showed some photographs of people with markings on their skin um, yeah. that were similar to the patterns yeah. in these paintings. And I, I, I presume you you asked them what what the significance of those patterns were. I mean, perhaps the use of patterns in the recent past or even in the present can be a key to understanding some of the significance or maybe a, a clue at any rate. Um, well, that, that, that's that's one question. The yeah. other question was that I noticed one of the um, images that you showed looked quite different in style i think you was it um maria chica concepcion it it it, they, the, it was uh markings they seem to be zoomorphic markings or, or or patterns on black patterns on white in in the image you showed and i uh recently read edwin ruthven heath's account of his exploration of the river benny in 1880 to 81. And they, those images reminded me of carvings that he saw by the falls and rapids of the rivers Madeira and Mamoré. So I wondered if you were aware, I, I don't know if that's now in Brazil or you know where, where these particular carvings are, but he, mm. he, he sketched them when he was uh, traveling there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, first of all, ethnographic evidence that was by Erland Nordenskjöld uh, in the 1920s so it was not me and um, he recorded the images and he also indicates in his book some explanations by the local people but very, very briefly. So uh, the indigenous people told them, this is a sign called, for example, turtle. Or they told him, these dots signif signify jaguar. So there are um, identifications there, but it's not enough to explain all that. Um, we are interested in much more detailed explanations. Uh, why did they put it on their body um, and so on? Uh, on the other hand, the same applies to Chiquitania um, in the colonial times. The Jesuit mentions that people uh, decorated their faces, but that's all. No recording, no detailed description, and so on. So it's really, really very difficult. On the other hand, Heath, Rio Bini, and so on. Uh, yes, there is rock art. Um, to my mind, these engravings are different from what we have in Chiquitania. I'm quite familiar with uh, all these sources. And we started a different project in Rio Beni, um, recording petroglyphs there along um, River Beni in the Bolivian Amazon region. But personally, I think it's a different story. Thank you, Matthias. I have Winston who is raising his hand. So go ahead, Winston, please. Matthias, thank you very much. It was a very um, 
um, memorable presentation. You know, I think it's, uh, um, it's quite unique. Uh, I think also it would have been, um, in a sense, in, we've done it in English and we've reached a particular audience, but I think this could quite easily be a, a presentation in Spanish. So we actually give back to the, local, to the local communities in a wider, in a wider um, sphere, all, all your knowledge. I think that, that, would, that is very, very important. But I'd like to follow up on what John and Marcella said. And this is really uh, looking at, and you talked about Northern Scold and the, um, the, the ethno-historical references, but I wonder if um, any work had been done with local communities to tap into local memory. I know there's a lot of time that this elapsed, I mean, from the 1920s when Northern School was um, writing about this, but I wonder if, because memory can pervade, can go, can persist over a long time. I mean, if we, if communities are, are in praise or, or reverence of ancestors, then certainly there must be a memory that, that can connect with these, these elements as well. Um, and oral traditions, um, which are also very, very important. Um, I just want, and, and sacred sites, you know, are these considered sacred sites or not? It, it, what is the significance of them? I think that um, uh, you answered my question in the sense I was going to ask about possible representation in the colonial churches, but you said the Jesuits or the Dominicans or whatever, they didn't actually, this was not portrayed neither in their writings nor in the, in the paintings that, that were shown in in, in, in the churches, and I wonder, I wonder why. Um, I, 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 this is, that is basically the, the, the what, what, what I'm posing. I think is, does, does the memory still pervade? Does the memory still exist? And how can this be articulated moving forward? Because I think this is a very important element um, uh, for the history uh, of Robore, for the history of Santa Cruz and, and Bolivia. You know, to be able to recover this uh, um, and th this sense of being, which is very important. Yeah. yeah. Um, in general, the memory does not persist regarding rock art. Um, local people had no idea. And so we are trying to. Um, teach them about rock art and to show them the work of their ancestors in so far uh, as uh, regarding indigenous population. As a matter of fact, there are many people who have come in later uh, with no indigenous origins, but there are indigenous communities. Um, no, apparently no direct relation what does persist in some extent is ancient indigenous myths, parts of the ancient religion, some uh, worldviews and so on that have a pre-Spanic origin. Um, apparently the Jesuits did a very good work um, converting local people to, uh, to Christian communities and local people identify with them, uh, with that and with their Christian religion and so on. And um, this has in some way uh, broken the chain of the former traditions. When uh, Erland Nordenskjöld came to um, Chiquitano um, towns, I think it, uh, uh, where one of these villages, he soon said, oh, there's nothing for me to do, it's boring, and went away. Obviously, he might have stayed longer and um, as knowledgeist as Jürgen Riester in the 1960s still were able to record many ancient beliefs and customs and so on but nothing about rock art. Whereas in other parts of Bolivia, such as the north of the uh, department of Oruro, there are communities that still relate to rock art. 
that have um, certain rights that they uh, practice at rock art sites um, that even interpret rock art in some way. And uh, apparently nothing of that uh, exists in uh, Santa Cruz and Robori. Thank you. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, I have now Annie Koponex, who is raising her hand. Uh, Annie, you can talk now. You need to unmute your mic, Annie, you can talk. You need to unmute your mic, Annie. Well, it looks like there is some issues there, but if, if there are other questions, we are still have some time, so go ahead, please. Kate? Can, can I just make a point, which is that there was a, I think she was a Paraguayan historian called Josefina Pla, and she pointed out that in the mission churches decorated by the, well, the so-called converts, that most of the designs were actually geometric. And when you look at them, particularly the mesh pattern, the rhomboids and, and, and zigzags, mm -hmm. they are in many cases very similar to what was on the rocks. Mm -hmm. And I always, it struck me as very interesting that the people who were physically painting them onto the wall of the church were doing something that their ancestors had done millennia ago. And, and what Josefina Pla said was that she thought that the priests would have insisted that the, the painter stuck to these neutral, in their eyes, abstract designs, because they didn't want the, the um, converts to, fall into sort of innocent, terrible error of painting somebody with the wrong sort of halo or, or, or painting. I mean, it's a bit frivolous perhaps, but I mean, many of those rock paintings of men particularly are very evidently men and many figures in the gospels are men and you know, they could have gone, gone horribly wrong on the church walls. And so I, and the, I think you do see symbols that you see on the rocks, which is, it's not a complete cut off between the old and what you're working on now. I think there is a link through the church. Of course, rock art form part of a general cultural pattern. And uh, in particular, the geometric motives were probably everywhere on the body, on uh, objects, and so on. So they <clears throat> were in specific contexts uh, outside rock art and um, persisted for a long time. Thank you, Matthias. And I'm going to end now the session of q and with reading a comment of Harlan Murray that I think reflect the feeling of everybody. It's just one of the many comments that I received, but really it makes the feeling of everybody here. What a brilliant and fascinating presentation. Thank you so very much. With that, I gave the voice to Kate and Winston to finish this webinar. And once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I just want to echo that really. It is fascinating. I'm so very grateful to you for agreeing to do it, particularly when you have so many projects, you know, 
claiming your time. And we really are grateful. Thank you so much.